Hello everyone and welcome to our third installment of the 1993 epic Gettysburg here on Real History. My name is history professor Jared Frederick. We're glad that you could join us once again. We have thus far looked at day one, day two, and also the buildup to the Battle of Gettysburg, and we're going to continue into the evening of July 2nd and into that climactic final day of July 3rd, 1863. As I've said before, I have you know great affinity for this film. I have a lot of respect for it, uh, the scope of it, what it was trying to achieve, the wonderful novel that it's based off of, um, but that doesn't mean that it's a perfect film, either cinematically or historically, and that is what we are going to continue to take a look at on this round. As we take a look at this field hospital scene, um, yeah, this was this was a sort of vignette that was replicated time and time again in the greater Gettysburg area. Um, it, God knows how many like you know uh, miles you know uh, from the, the epicenter of Gettysburg that these hospitals uh, stretched out. Suffice it to say, every barn, house, church, school in the Gettysburg community was completely overwhelmed with dead, wounded, and dying men. Um, and, you know, just to give you a perspective, you know, there were over 10 times the number of wounded men at the Battle of Gettysburg than what existed in the community of Gettysburg itself. Um, for months on end afterward, uh, townspeople had to put peppermint oil and such on their handkerchiefs when they exited their house and, and went outside. And it wasn't until the, really the winter of 1863-1864 uh, that this overwhelming stench of death and carry-on finally uh, faded away. Um, just absolutely apocalyptic stuff. Casualty. What casualty? I don't know yet. Got to give my boys credit. In this moment we see General Longstreet conversing with one of his uh, trusted division commanders a fiery Kentuckian by the name of John Bell Hood, who had worked his way up through the ranks as a brigade commander, then on to a division commander. And uh, John Bell Hood was just one tough dude who refused to die. Uh, lost the use of his arm at Gettysburg. He would later uh, have one of his legs amputated, and even that wouldn't make him, you know, quit the Confederate Army. He, this was a guy who literally had to be strapped into the saddle uh, to lead men forward. And, uh, you know, later on when he's transitioned into the Western theater of the war and into Tennessee, he has uh, even less luck at, at the likes of the battles of Franklin and Nashville uh, in 1864. Um, this was a, a, a heroic guy, um, but it, it seems like the, the further that he worked up the ranks and the more responsibility that he was given, the, the less uh, well that he did um, as a result. And uh, he, he ultimately died about 15 years after the war as a result of a, a yellow fever epidemic. And so that's where his luck finally ran out. Got some night work. Are you up to? All the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. This character of Harrison uh, is, is really a, a colorful, wily character. And indeed, there is a lot of uh, theatrical flair to him. And Harrison, um, as we mentioned in a previous episode, uh, you know, he was involved in espionage work for the Confederate government. Um, he later goes on uh, to New York City, perhaps to uh, stir up some trouble um, in, in that town. When this is all over, I do look forward to seeing you on the stage. There's really scant evidence to suggest that he was an actor uh, before the war. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of it is, is just hearsay, and it, it kind of balloons into this thing of fiction becoming fact um, over time. In the director's cut of Gettysburg's prequel, Gods and Generals, it even has him acting in scenes with, with John Wilkes Booth, um, and uh, it's it's just very, very unlikely that, that that was the case. 
He certainly had uh, an ability to put on a good act as a spy, but whether or not he acted on the stage is something else entirely. General, I am very glad to see you well. Well, I just come by for my order, sir. As I referenced before, um, these scenes depicting General Lee's headquarters were filmed at the historic Slider Farm at the base of Big Round Top within the, the borders of Gettysburg National Military Park. And, uh, you know, they had to cover up some modern intrusion. And uh, there's, there's, there's a large monument uh, here in, in the yard of this farmhouse. And so they had to build this like 10 foot high outhouse uh, to put over it um, in order to conceal it. I could feel them breaking. And there for a moment I thought I saw our flags go up the hill. One of the primary reasons why the Confederate attacks here on the, the Union left fail on July 2nd is like I mentioned earlier, distance and communication, or a lack thereof in regard to communication. When John Bell Hood is seriously wounded, um, the, the chain of command or the responsibility goes down to one of his division commanders, a guy by the name of Evander Law. And um, for a, a large portion of the fighting, Evander Law did not even realize that the chain of command had been passed down to him. And so he was continuing to lead his um, brigade rather than the whole division. Um, and so this is one of many factors that lead to these somewhat uncoordinated attacks that the character of Robert E. Lee is suggesting of here. Um, and then the other thing is distance. Uh, the Confederate lines on Seminary Ridge and Warfield Ridge are about a mile away from Cemetery Ridge. And as Confederates break through in certain locations, their reserves, their reinforcements, additional help, they're simply too far away. And as one Confederate officer later attested, uh, the problem wasn't going, the problem was staying. Because thanks to the Federal troops' interior lines, their ability and flexibility to move men comparatively easier from one spot to another greatly favored them in this battle. That is one of the main reasons why Union troops win this fight, in addition to the apt leadership of General George Gordon Meade, who, as we said, only gets about 30 seconds in this film. You know, hearing you talk about monkeys and trees, I'm remembered of a time during a cannonade on the peninsula when there was just oh, one Lord. tree for the men to hide behind. And as these camp scenes and conversations are ongoing on the night of July 2nd, um, something that is not at all mentioned in the film is the fact that the longest sustained fighting of the battle is going on simultaneously with all of this. Um, because where General Longstreet attempted to attack the Union left in the afternoon and evening of July 2nd, um, you know, a few hours after that, on the Union right, General Richard Yoel is striking Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. And the fighting on Culp's Hill will go on for eight continuous hours. In nightfall, no less, which is a very acute rarity in uh, battles during the American Civil War. Um, if you thought communication was bad in regard to the fighting on, on Little Round Top and the Union left, um, it's a whole other ball game when you're trying to move thousands of men in the dark without telecommunications in enemy terrain, no less. I intend to lay this matter to rest for once and for all time. Oh, good. Perringer's beard looks really bad here. <laughs> what do you hear about Hancock? Ran into him today. This conversation underscores one of the great tragedies of the American Civil War, and that is the fact that these former comrades who served in the United States Army now find themselves uh, bitter enemies on these uh, bloodied landscapes of this conflict. And perhaps among the most poignant of them is that of the relationship of General Lewis Armistead and uh, his good friend Winfield Scott Hancock. And uh, in 1861, um, both of these men were stationed in San Diego, where they were involved um, in various quartermaster duties um, out west. Um, and as was 
often the case at, at a number of these military installations out west. Uh, you had these officers making these supreme decisions of whether to remain loyal to the United States or to go with the cause of their individual respective states. And uh, of course, um, it is at this moment, as the story goes, um, that these two officers uh, part their ways. And uh, ultimately, uh, Winfield Scott Hancock, being from Pennsylvania, uh, of course, uh, remains loyal to the Union and Louis Armistead decided to betray his oath that he took as uh, an officer. And uh, at Gettysburg, Armistead commands one of General Pickett's brigades comprised of Virginians and Winfield Scott Hancock is the commander of the Union Army's Second Corps. And indeed, he was one of the best generals that they had within that army. So help me. If I ever raise my hand against you, may God strike me dead. On a production note, it's interesting to consider the fact that actor Richard Jordan, who plays Louis Armistead in this film, uh, was dying of cancer as this film was being shot. And you can't help but think, as his character is conveying a lot of the emotion in these various scenes, that you know the, the fact of Jordan's own mortality hovering above him uh, it didn't make this cinematic representation all the more powerful. I can't say that with any certainty, but uh, it's, it's fair to speculate. And tomorrow is the 4th of July. Sir? Independence Day? I'd quite forgotten. Good Lord has a sense of humor. These considerations of the American Revolution are rather revealing um, because indeed both sides thought that they were fighting the sequel to the American Revolution. Federal troops believed that they were defending the country that the founding generation had created through the American Revolution, a functioning democracy that was worth fighting for and perpetuating. I mean, meanwhile, um, many Confederates considered themselves to be the new founding generation. That like those soldiers in the American Revolution, they were out to create a country of their own and to break away from a larger government that no longer represented their views or their economic interests. Um, and so these are important ideological things to keep in mind. This finally brings us to the morning of July 3rd. And this scene here was actually filmed on Little Round Top and behind a big fake bush there, you can faintly see the silhouette of General Governor Kemble Warren, his statue, uh, that is, which is one of the most iconic statues um, in the park. Uh, but ultimately, um, the 20th Maine was not on Little Round Top at this time. Uh, they were still up on Big Round Top uh, where they had been moved to the previous night. Uh, but it's certainly understandable uh, why they are located here in this spot uh, because uh, Big Round Top is entirely wooded. Uh, you can't see anything. This big huge vista of the actual battlefield that we see unfolding here before our characters uh, is certainly a sight to behold. The vista that we see here before the Chamberlain brothers, there's a lot more foliage though than what there was at the time of the battle and what there is now. Because over the past 20 years, the National Park Service has embarked on a landscape restoration process to remove non-historic tree lines in order to restore 1863 view sheds. In 1992, when this movie was being filmed, that project was still about eight or nine years away from uh, taking root. Um, and so uh, this movie also shows us how a battlefield, a historical park, continues to evolve over time. Um, and from, from a historian's perspective, 
Um, this movie is very unique because it offers us a time capsule view of the battlefield, not necessarily of 1863, but of 1992 when this movie was made. So it's interesting to think outside the box in that sort of context at times. They are well entrenched up there. They aim to fight. They got good artillery and plenty of it. Sir, any attack we make will be uphill over open ground. This uh, big cowboy hat that Tom Berenger is wearing was an artistic choice on the actor's part. Um, these sorts of hats were, were not uh, incredibly common uh, during the, the, the Civil War era. And uh, a lot of the historical evidence would seem to suggest that James Longstreet actually wore a kepi. A kind of the ubiquitous soldier cap that you see a lot of, uh, of troops wearing um, in this film and in uh, Civil War photos. Um, it, it's almost a bit distracting um, at times, even more so than, than his phony beard. Uh, but you know, um, it, it is what it is and you, your eye certainly focuses on him, which is perhaps what Tom Berenger wanted. And I have never yet left the enemy in command of the field, no sir. Retreat is no longer an option. Lee actually did leave the enemy in command of, of the field at least once, and that was the Battle of Antietam the previous September, uh, where he and the Army of Northern Virginia retreated uh, back across the Potomac. And the Army of the Potomac was left in the command of the area around Sharpsburg, Maryland. Colonel Chamberlain. At some point, sir. Here we see actor Billy Campbell, who just uh, a year or two prior to the movie Gettysburg, uh, acted in the, the Disney uh, action film The Rocketeer. And uh, he, along with Russell Crowe, uh, was one of the finalists to uh, portray the role of Chamberlain. Um, but as is quite obvious, Jeff Daniels uh, got that slot and Billy Campbell got a, a far lesser role as a result. What I will do is give you two other divisions, General Pettigrew and General Trimble. So now you will have nearly three divisions at your command, including General Pickett. If there were two other divisions in addition to Pickett's involved in Pickett's Charge, it leads to the important question of why is it called Pickett's Charge. This is the Army of Northern Virginia. And most of the reporters and correspondents following the Army of Northern Virginia are in fact from Virginia. And as they are writing their reports back home to anxious readers, you can guess what focus they are going to take. They are going to focus on Pickett's Virginians, hence the name Pickett's Charge. Um, to the chagrin of a lot of North Carolinians and Tennesseans and Mississippians who also participated in that assault. And there's a lot of historical banter um, in the years to follow. And uh, a lot of them argued that the correct phrase should have been the Pickett Pettigrew Trimble charge. Um, although some historians have come to just broadly call it Longstreet's assault. I've always been very cautious. Very cautious. There is no one I trust more. Longstreet had a very good instinct on what was going to happen here. Um, and he, he later proclaimed this perspective in his post-war memoirs, which gained him a, a bountiful amount of scorn from a lot of his fellow Confederate veterans and subordinates because he dared to be critical of Robert E. Lee in these memoirs, and doing so of the marble man, the, the saint of the Southern cause at that time was considered a big no-no. Um, but for Longstreet, you know, it was his men who mowed down federal troops in front of the stone wall at Maury's Heights at Fredericksburg the previous December. He knew very well what an enemy entrenched behind stone walls and fortified on high ground could do to men and these concentrated ranks moving across these open swaths of terrain. His personal history spoke to this, uh, but Lee would, had, would have none of it, and Lee was of the mind that is where the enemy is, and therefore that is where I will strike him. A fateful decision indeed. I've been told by some individuals who were extras in this film that this moment of uh, Confederate troops greeting Robert E. Lee was uh, something of a, of a spontaneous scene. 
that uh, Martin Sheen was rotting down the line and uh, a lot of the extras playing Confederates just, uh, you know, started running up to him and, and cheering because in their mind it seemed like, you know, he was Robert E. Lee, that people were in the moment. And uh, Keyes Van Oostrom, the cinematographer of the, for this film, had uh, the good instinct to turn the cameras around and, uh, and start filming. And then there were some additional close-ups that we can see here uh, that were incorporated. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a poignant moment um, in the film, undoubtedly. Um, because even though many of these men are soon to march to their deaths, uh, there is this uh, sublime confidence in Robert E. Lee as he is about to send them off on this climactic assault on July 3rd. Colonel Alexander, those federal cannon up on that little rocky hill can cause us some trouble. Edward Porter Alexander uh, was likewise uh, one of uh, the artillerists who, uh, you know, knocked down federal troops at Fredericksburg like they were bowling pins. And like Longstreet, he too wrote a very excellent memoir about his Confederate service, and it, it's often considered to be one of uh, the finer of uh, Confederate memoirs chronicling these experiences during the American Civil War. So uh, there possibly is another one to add to your reading list. It's, uh, it, it's fun to reference the fact that a lot of these actors um, became uh, very uh, familiar and cozy in, in Gettysburg itself, um, including Tom Berenger, uh, who uh, made the, the, the popular watering hole in Gettysburg, the Farnsworth House, which is still in operation today. Um, Berenger deemed this to be the new headquarters of the Army of Northern Virginia, and that was a popular hangout among um, a lot of these actors um, after their, their long days out in the field. Johnson Pettigrew, University of North Carolina. Yeah, I know. They still talk about your grades there with reverence and awe. General Pettigrew here, um, is actually portrayed by uh, the British actor uh, George Lazenby, uh, who acted as James Bond in, uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And so James Bond is, is in the movie Gettysburg, and uh, a lot of people don't recognize him with uh, the facial growth. And of course, he's one of the lesser known Bonds because he was only in uh, one movie, uh, but I think he has a fairly convincing uh, South or uh, Southern accent, um, nonetheless. Fun little bit of trivia. Gentlemen, that is the conversion point. That clump of trees. Those uh, clump of trees, or the the copse or copse of trees, however you prefer to call it, uh, would uh, soon after the war become memorialized. Um, an entity known as the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, the, the forerunner to the National Park Service on this site, uh, put a cast iron fence around that clump of trees because it was thought by park historians of the time that this was the symbolic high water mark of the Confederacy, that this is where the, the high tide of the South uh, had ultimately been pushed back. And, uh, you know, in reality, um, at the time of the battle, uh, that clump of trees was, you know, a bunch of small saplings. Um, and if anything, you know, it wasn't so much a, a target, but rather a visual marker or a visual beacon for Confederate troops to use as they were navigating their way uh, across the field. But um, in all of the decades since, uh, the ancestors of those trees uh, have taken on almost a... a spiritual connotation. Um, but for all of the battlefield photographs that were taken in 1863, not a single one included that area where this clump of trees was or where Pickett's Charge was repulsed. Did uh, photographers at the time think that area wasn't important or was there simply nothing dramatic to photograph in those spots? Uh, but it certainly leads to uh, an interesting question here. Sir, would you mind giving someone an order to give me a musket? I think today I'd like to join the attack. If I could even borrow a hat, sir, from some soldier, or just a jacket. Some 
The actor playing Harrison, a gentleman by the name of Cooper Huckabee, and uh, in addition to being in uh, Django Unchained, um, about 10 years prior to the movie Gettysburg, um, he was in a fairly popular Civil War miniseries entitled The Blue and the Gray. And so this is not the first time that he portrayed a Confederate. And a lot of those uh, 1980s Civil War miniseries uh, really helped to build momentum for films like this that would come out in the 1990s because the success of those shows demonstrated that there was in fact an audience for stories about the American Civil War. And so this actor has a, a unique connection to that progression when you think about it. General Hancock, sir. Colonel Chamberlain, 20th Maine. Chamberlain? I'm beginning to hear from the ranks that you may have been a bit more involved than anyone up in staff has told me. The 20th Maine was nowhere near the federal center on July 3rd. Um, this is an entirely different sector, commanded by an entirely different corps commander. Um, the 20th Maine was part of the 5th Corps, which was commanded by General George Sykes. This area here, and in this scene, where Chamberlain is introduced to the second corps commander, Winfield Scott Hancock, is, is rather ahistorical. Um, Hancock is not Chamberlain's boss, <laughs> uh, but not in any way really, other than the fact that Hancock is higher in rank and in the same army. But artistically, it's completely understandable, because uh, what Michael Shera and director Ronald F. Maxwell were doing is that they were trying to bring about a convergence of the main characters. Uh, and, and when you think about it in that sort of light, it, it's perfectly understandable because uh, as a result, in these moments, uh, you know, General Hancock can ruminate with Chamberlain, the college professor. They can, uh, you know, uh, begin to uh, ponder, you know, the nature of war old friends fighting against each other, uh, so on and so forth. And when you think about it in that light, it absolutely works. Can you recall a story from antiquity where two men who are best of friends, almost brothers? Chamberlain and Hancock standing uh, side by side though, um, uh, their heights, their respective heights are contrary to what they actually were. Uh, Hancock was over six feet in height, um, and Chamberlain was a little bit under six feet. And so had this conversation actually taken place, uh, Hancock would have been the, the taller man and he would have overshadowed Chamberlain in this regard. That's really nitpicky stuff, um, but it, it's kind of fun to think about anyway. He died this morning before I got there. Yeah. Jeff Daniels is such a good actor. I mean, uh, he has the blue ribbon performance um, in this movie, um, conveying such emotion with uh, just facial expression and, and so few words. And, you know, it, even though Kill Rain is a fictional character, you can't help but, you know, be, be punched by this emotion, um, you know, when you get word that his character has died. And um, this, this movie, and particularly that scene, it left such an imprint on a, a lot of viewers. Um, you know, that they believed that Kilrain was in fact a real person. And uh, one time when I was given a tour in the National Cemetery, a visitor came up to me um, and, you know, wondered why she could not find a Buster Kilrain's grave in the main section of, of the Soldiers National Cemetery. And uh, uh, she was uh, rather heartbroken uh, to find out that <laughs> Buster Kilrain was not a real person. Uh, so the power of cinema indeed. It was around 1 o'clock on the afternoon of July 3rd that two signal guns from Seminary Ridge fired and that commenced the Confederate bombardment upon Cemetery Ridge. And approximately uh, 175 pieces of Confederate artillery participated in this barrage that was meant to weaken the Union defenses. But uh, often the case 
Uh, you know, and it was certainly the case with D-Day as well, is that these pre-insult bombardments uh, often do not have the intended effect, and the Confederates were about to find that out the hard way. Uh, the film Gettysburg is cinematically unique because with these overhead shot of the cannon, uh, this is actually one of the first, if not the first, use of an aerial drone uh, in, in regard to cinematography. Uh, now certainly uh, drones are a lot uh, lighter in weight and more mobile and easier to operate all of these years later. Uh, it was more like a small remote controlled helicopter uh, used here on, on the set of Gettysburg. Um, but you know, it's, it's one really interesting cinematic legacy that a lot of directors of course are going to be using in years hence as cinematic technology continues to evolve. And so it's an interesting first that is associated with this movie. Uh, one of the, the townspeople uh, who was living in the Gettysburg community at this time, who was uh, riding out the storm, so to speak, as this bombardment was ongoing, uh, wrote and, and said it was, it was almost as if heaven and earth were colliding. Uh, such was the, 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 the mammoth boom and, and bust associated uh, with all of this. And, uh, you know, reports of the bombardment, the sound, the reverberation of it uh, could r reportedly be heard as far away as Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, which was located about 45 miles to the north. And that may seem like a stretch to us today, uh, but without highways and noise pollution and vehicles, Sound carried a whole lot farther back in the 1860s uh, than what they do now in the 21st century. So it's certainly in the realm of possibility. 